Well, good morning and welcome to the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute presentation on marketing. That's going to be interesting. <laughs> okay, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute presentation on market and marketing updates and opportunities. Uh, we have 45 minutes for this presentation, so I'll be very brief with my introduction. I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Ashley Heimbigner and Mr. Bruce Shackler, Shackler both who present this morning uh, at ASME's Comfish Forum. Um, Ashley is the ASME Communications Director and Bruce is the Director of the ASME Alaska Global Food Aid Program. I would also like to recognize um, Kimberly Valverde, who is ASME's Marketing and Communications Specialist. <clears throat> uh, as the ASME Communications Director, Ashley supports and promotes the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute's brand and messaging efforts, domestic and consumer public relations, and in-state and fleet communications. Ashley has over 12 years of experience in the fields of domestic and international markets. These include domestic and international markets, and the promotion of Alaska brands in the tourism, nonprofit, and food sectors. Ashley lives in Juneau, and she has been working with ASME since 2018. Bruce Schockler is the director of ASME's Global Food Aid Program. Bruce is a Kodiak resident and a multi-species fisherman since 1976. Bruce represents ASME, his industry, and his catch by managing the state of Alaska's interaction with the United States Department of Agriculture and several other federal and non-federal agencies and entities with respect to all things dealing with Alaska seafood. Bruce's efforts represent the ASME Global Food Aid Program and has resulted in the purchase of over $100 million in Alaska seafood products by the USDA for their supplemental nutrition program in 2021 alone. And of course, there have been other benefits as well, but this is just for 2021. Bruce is also the marketing chairman for the United Fishermen of Alaska. So please uh, join me in welcoming Ashley and Bruce. Um, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, everyone at Comfish, for having us here today and everyone streaming online and to everyone that came in this morning on this beautiful Kodiak day. We were talking earlier, and we're from Juneau, which gets a lot of weather. It's We're in a rainforest, um, but this is aggressive. <laughs> you guys got some weather. It's been fun. Um, he made it interesting. Um, so is, can we pull up my presentation? Great. Uh, as Jeff said, I'm the communications director for the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, what we do, and then also about how we're representing you and your catch in all of our global markets and the conditions that are out there and that we're facing in the market. Um, is there a... Uh, I'm the clicker. Oh, the clicker. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so um, I have to say up front, Bruce and I strongly disagree on one thing. Well, probably many things, but one thing is um, I, I love PowerPoint. He hates it. Um, I, I love, I love having pretty pictures and videos tell the story for us for Alaska seafood. I'm not quite the orator that Bruce is. So I'm going to, I've got a lot of slides that I'm going to run through and, and hopefully you guys enjoy. And then Bruce will join at the end and talk about um, his program and the great work that they're doing. So what is ASME? Just a raise of hands. How many, how many of you know the basics of what ASME does? Great, wonderful. So, so our job, our reason for being is to represent you and your catch around the world. We, our mission is to increase the value and awareness of Alaska's seafood resource. And we do that through a variety of ways, including um, marketing promotional efforts around the globe, um, developing new markets for Alaska seafood and Alaska seafood products. And then of course, working closely with our industry members to maximize those efforts. We are a public private partnership between the state of Alaska and Alaska's seafood industry. And we're primarily funded through um, statutory designated program receipts, which means one half of 1% of the ex vessel value of Alaska's catch each year is paid to the state of Alaska, the Department of Revenue through Alaska seafood processors. Um, which comes to ASME's budget. We also receive uh, 
about a third of our budget comes from federal funding through the USDA's market access program funds, and that funds our international marketing efforts. Okay, next slide. So before I talk about what ASME is doing, I wanted to just to do a quick touch base on the value of Alaska seafood. I never turned down an opportunity to talk about how important our industry is to our state and our country. Next slide. So we just in January of this year released the latest edition of the Economic Value of Alaska Seafood um, Alaska Seafood Industry Report. We do this with McKinley Research Group every two years, um, and it's sort of our Bible for, for taking a look at just how important our industry is. Um, no surprise, this report continued to affirm um, how, just how important um, it is to, in terms of workforce and, and economic contributions to the state. Um, I have co copies of the report here. It's also available online, um, but to dive a little bit deeper, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, Alaska Seafood contributed $5.7 billion in economic output in 2019, um, and about 10% of Alaska's employment during that period. Um, it also has broad economic distribution, which stretches from Ketchikan to Kodiak, and it's not just Alaska's coastal cities that benefit from Alaska seafood industry. Next slide. Uh, since we're in Kodiak, I thought I'd do a little bit of a deeper dive into Kodiak. Um, Kodiak was the third largest commercial um, fishing port in the U.S. by volume in 2019, and I love this fact, Kodiak seafood processors employ the highest percentage of local residents um, as part of their processing workforce, which I think is reflected if you look down in the economic trends area, um, you can see that, that while well, 2020 of course was a year that was impacted across the board in all sectors of the fishing industry, um, Kodiak retained the majority of its processing workforce, um, which was of course a lot of Alaska re residents. Okay. So, the report that I was just talking about reflects 2019. Typically, we do a two-year reflection so that we can average out the pink salmon numbers. Um, but for this year or for this edition, we did just 2019 because 2020 was such an anomaly in so many ways. It wasn't reflective of the Alaska seafood industry and the way it operates typically. So what we just saw was 2019, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about 2020 and the way the industry was hit. None of this is a surprise to any of you, of course, but I think it's important to look back. Um, the biggest one, of course, is, is increased operating costs. On the processing sector side, uh, there's an estimated $170 million spent on COVID mitigation measures between 2020 and 2021. Um, and those mitigation measures are continuing. There was dramatic shifts in the food space across the globe. Uh, transportation logistics continue to be challenging. Um, and uh, a significant drop in ex vessel value across the board in 2020. But most importantly, fisheries still operated thanks to the work that all of you did. It, we know it wasn't easy. It was amazing watching everyone come together uh, to pull off and execute fisheries safely and to provide that essential service to get Alaska's incredible, nutritious, sustainable protein to the world. Okay. Looking ahead, um, most of these mitigation measures are still in place at a lot of places. It's, there's still costs that we're facing to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. Hiring, of course, is challenging, um, not least of which it is, comes from the 28% rise um, related to the H2B visas, or 28% rise in um, wage related to H2B visas. And, um, but we are seeing about a 50% recovery in terms of employment between 21, 2020 and 2021. So you can see here, there are about 20,000 um, employees in the processing sector in 2019, 2020 dipped to about 15 or 16,000, and then um, 2021 was about 18,000. So we are seeing a partial recovery. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later, so we'll go on to the next one. We don't have full numbers for uh, 2021 ex vessel value yet, but we as McKinley Research Group estimates um, a return to sort of the, the lower end of the normal range of ex vessel value in 2021. It's still a little bit difficult to tell what impact um, is coming from ex vessel prices or prices and, and what is coming from biological factors. Here's a look at the export value. And again, you can see sort of a 2021, we are seeing a partial recovery. Um, in terms of excess value, uh, but this is primarily due to increased prices. If you go to the next slide, um, express or volume was, was pretty flat in 2021. Okay. 
But 2020, there's a lot of optimism um, in 2022, strong prices, uh, but a lower tack for Pollock. Um, this slide was actually created before the, the ban on Russian seafood coming into the US. So that, that point about strong prices is um, probably even more relevant than ever. Um, it's, of course, we're, we're gonna be watching to see what the market can bear in terms of pricing. Um, 60 plus million uh, Bristol Bay sake harvest potential, going to be keeping an eye on processing capacity, of course, and workforce availability. Everyone, you know, in all sectors is facing that struggle. It's an even year for pinks. So we're looking at lower production volume there. And then sablefish halibut and cod uh, tack increases as well. So lots of optimism for 2022. Okay. So that's sort of a baseline in terms of the market. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what ASME is doing with that information to represent the catch. Um, ASME programs, these are the kind of the five core programs, uh, international marketing, domestic marketing, communications, our seafood technical program, and global food aid. Starting with domestic marketing, this is uh, food service and retail, primary biz primarily business to business activities in the US and Canada. Um, this is a promotion that's actually going on right now. If you're down in the lower 48, there are about 400 taco johns that are featuring Alaska flounder fish tacos um, and highlighting Alaska seafood sustainability and the great messaging behind the brand. Um, just to give you an idea of the scope of what this program does in the U.S., in 2021, um, they conducted 35,000 retail and e-commerce um, promotions and partnered with over 18,000 food service establishments. And this is just sort of a smattering of the brands that they work with. I like this is a snapshot from a promotional piece that the domestic team put together, but but really the gist of it and the gist of what they do is communicating with retailers and buyers that if you put Alaska seafood on your menu, if you plot it in your shelf space, if you use the Alaska seafood origin call out and logo, you will get more customers buying more seafood and with more trust in your brand. Um, so we do a lot of research to convey that and to help sell Alaska seafood in. On the international marketing side, uh, we have conduct programs in nine program areas in 42 countries. Alaska seafood is sold in over hundred countries around the world. Um, but this is where we find the most value for our dollar uh, through these program areas. Exactly. Um, about 75% of Alaska seafood production is, is exported annually. This is sort of a heat map of where Alaska seafood goes. Um, the green circles are markets that ASME has program areas in, the red is not. Um, you'll see South Korea is a red circle and that's because it's primarily reprocessing sector. We do a little bit of marketing there, um, maintaining the brand, but, but because it's primarily reprocessing, we focus our markets, marketing efforts in um, some of the, the end markets for those products. Here's sort of a, a different way of looking at that information. And I think this is really interesting. Um, interesting way at, at looking at the importance of market diversification. So China is our largest or trading partner by volume. Um, however, you can see in 2017, that we were really hitting a, an upward swing with direct sales into China. And then of course, 2018, when the China tariffs um, came into place that, that slowly went down further. And then in 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic had an, had an even bigger impact. We are seeing some increases in 2021 that give us some room for optimism. Um, but you can see the other markets. Oh, sorry, go back, Ben. Sorry. That's okay. Our other markets have have picked up the slack um, and are growing. Uh, this is the, last year was the first year that Japan be, uh, surpassed China, or first year since 2010 that Japan surpassed China as the largest um, consumer of Alaska seafood by value. Our European markets are growing, and then I want to call attention to Southeast Asia. Um, and South America, while they're small, they are growing significantly. And just in the first year of our Southeast Asia program, which we launched in 2019, um, we saw double digit growth um, in multi for multiple sea species in both volume and value. Um, so we're really excited to continue our efforts in there, those regions, um, especially as unrest across the world um, continues. Okay, thank you. Um, just, we always feel like it's important to provide a little global context for the work that we do. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for Alaska seafood right now in terms of what consumers are looking for. People are more interested in sustainable, nutritious product. They want to know where their product come from, comes from. Um, 
And with the Russian seafood ban, of course, that's a lot of product that has been moved out of our market. But these opportunities are not unique to Alaska seafood. There are a lot of competitors out there that are seeing the same opportunities and investing a lot of money in, in talking to those same consumers as well. So it's just something that we have to always be aware of. Um, Alaska salmon is 9% of the global supply, or at least it was in 2020. Most of that remaining supply is farmed. Just to give some context, more coho farmed, there's more coho farmed in Chile than all of the sockeye produced out of Alaska. The Norwegian Seafood Council has a global marketing budget that is more than three times larger than ASME's budget. So, I mean, we're, just means we have to be very efficient and we, uh, all of our marketing efforts are very research-based and focused to make sure we're getting the most bang for our buck. Um, and then competitors around the globe are also investing in their infrastructure. Russia in particular was in investing a, a massive amount of money into building up their processing um, and harvesting workforce. Who knows what's happening right now? Um, <laughs> But it's something, again, for us to just be mindful about what Alaska is up against in the global market. Okay, so I represent the communications and PR program. We are the storytellers of Alaska Seafood, um, and it's an honor to be able to get to do that. Uh, we, I have to show this slide here. Um, this was a, a great media relations effort that we conducted with the Today Show and Hannah Heimbach, who is a local harvester. Uh, local Harvester and on ASME's communications committee, um, we were part of their Earth Week promotion where she talked about the sustainability of Alaska seafood and how you can source sustainable seafood by buying Alaska. The picture on the far side there, that's uh, some a piece that we put together in response to all of the misinformation coming out um, with Seaspiracy, uh, just an example of the work that we're doing to make sure consumers have Alaska seafood top of mind um, and with the best and most accurate messaging when they get to the point of purchase. Okay, I'm just gonna go through this quickly because we all lived it. But before I talked about, you know, impact of COVID-19 to the seafood industry, this is sort of the marketing side and what we experienced as consumers. Um, there was a lockdown buying frenzy, food service upheaval, just everything shut down, everything moved online, including meetings, including this meeting, um, and as well as promotions and, um, seafood sales. We started focusing on delivery promotions, omni-channel shopping. There was even food service that had moved to retail because retail was blowing up. On the food service side, they started reopening, but with much slimmer menus. And now, of course, worldwide shipping crisis and global inflation. So it's been a couple, you know, we've been through a lot the last couple of years. It's been a whirlwind, but again, lots of opportunity. Um, for us, we've been keeping, keeping a close eye on it. And what's, what's really interesting, I think about this is, is this slide was originally developed by our international marketing director. And it's something that our, any of our programs could use because the pandemic created kind of a singular global moment where all consumers were sort of facing the same thing around the world. Um, so next slide. So how are we addressing this? Um, we're connecting with those home cooks that started cooking at home during the pandemic. We're focusing on e-commerce, Health and, wellness, health and wellness, keeping an eye on emerging trends and focusing on sharing transparency and the story behind Alaska seafood. Okay, so 71% of people say they will continue to cook at home after the pandemic ends. Um, how Do you guys feel that's true? Are you still cooking more than you did at home? It's not, not everyone. Some people are really ready to get back to, to um, restaurants, but we're finding that all of those people that, that tried seafood at home for the first time that are cooking seafood at home more. They're also looking for seafood more often at food service as well, which is really exciting for us. Um, so as me over the last two years, we've been putting together some really, you know, um, wonderful recipes and cooking tips that support both the new home cook that's maybe trying it for the first time. And then the board home cook that like really wants to get inspiration and continue to expand their home cooking skills. We're also partnering with um, e-commerce promotions to because people aren't just cooking at home, they're shopping at home. And more and more, we're seeing Alaska seafood mo move into that online shopping basket. We're also online working with influencers to help make that message full circle. So folks you know, will be scrolling through their Instagram feed. They'll watch a video from Tyler Florence um, and his crab cake crusted Alaska halibut and then get inspired to uh, go online, order groceries, and cook at home. 
this is our new Alaska seafood website, alaskaseafood.org. If you haven't been recently, I highly encourage you to check it out. It's a wealth of resources for both consumers and industry members. But one of my favorite features about it is, uh, next slide, is our recipe catalog. There are hundreds of recipes here that are categorized in a really easy way. It's nicely searchable. You can favorite your favorites. And soon we just launched a feature. Um, here's an example of some of the recipes that we have on the website. These recipes are, will be shoppable. So you can go to any of these recipes, click that get ingredients button, and it will immediately take you to your local grocer. So you can throw them in your, in your basket. It'll pull in Alaska seafood. Um, and so we can sort of cut out the middleman and get you right from inspiration to point of purchase. So speaking of e-commerce, e-commerce is not going away. It's so convenient. Um, people around the world, it's become part of their routine. And it's expected that it will account for 20% of the grocery market by 2026. That's here in the US and around in other parts of the world, it's much higher than that. Um, this is just an example of monthly retail sales here in the US. And this, this line, the orange line at the top, that's e-commerce. So it continues to grow and it's not going away. Even as food service, the blue line has started to rebound and grocery is still significantly higher than where it was pre-pandemic. Here's an example of, again, some of the e-commerce pro, uh, products available from Alaska Seafood. This is a Whole Foods product. And so we're working with partners like Instacart to um, do Alaska Seafood promotions through all of these brands. It's been really successful, and we're looking at expanding our e-commerce promotions um, into 2022. And one of the ways we're doing that, one of the great things about e-commerce is it gives you more space to tell the story and opportunities to link back to other messaging. Um, and here, so I'm going to show a quick video of some of the, the messaging we've put together to help support the story. So we're doing um, over 20 videos along the same lines that tell the story of individual species as well as the Alaska seafood story, talking about our sustainability measures and more. Um, but health and wellness is also really important to consumers around the globe. Next slide. Um, so we're conducting uh, advertising and public relations efforts to make sure that when you think health food, you think Alaska seafood. Next slide. Um, here's an example actually from one of our European markets. Um, this January, we launched Wild Alaska Seafood Month throughout Europe. Uh, this is in, in the UK and in Germany, they conducted a real fitness and health focus there. This photo here in the middle um, is from a, um, a gym in, in the UK. And so this Alaska Seafood messaging was shown um, throughout uh, gym facilities in the UK. And then you can see on the far, that's a, an advertisement that went up in Germany. Um, if you can play this black screen, if you'll click on that right there. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So just sort of a, <laughs> this was a, a, a scrolling ad that was um, played on social media and uh, at, at retail um, in Europe as well. So we found that, you know, while people are exercising, while they're getting hungry and they're thinking about their fitness, that they're also thinking about Alaska seafood. Here in the U.S., we hit the morning show circuit with a registered dietitian, Francis Largeman Roth, who talked all about Alaska seafood and um, the importance of incorporating it into your diet two times a week. Um, and she showcased a, a number of Alaska seafood species, as you can see here. So recipes, recipes, recipes. I know I said this before, but our research continues to tell us that, that consumers are inspired to buy when they have, um, or 
this just came out this week. Most consumers could be enticed to eat more seafood, especially if they were provided recipe ideas. That's great inspiration for us. So we're going to continue to follow that. But what kind of recipes to provide? Our research is also telling us that, for example, Asian cuisine dominates global food consumption. The next slide. So here are a couple of recipes that we just released with Food 52. Um, a gojujang marinade sable fish with shiitakes. The next one. This is a DIY Alaska canned salmon hand roll with Alaska salmon roe. All of these recipes are on our website, but we also use platforms like Food 52 to expand our message even further. Um, last year when Nashville hot was becoming really hot, um, <laughs> we put out recipe inspiration for incorporating those flavors into Alaska seafood menus to make sure we're always top of mind with where the consumers are going. And then social media influencers, love them or hate them, they're here to stay and they have a lot of value. 73% um, of consumers make purchases after seeing them on social and they trust subject matter experts like influencers as spokespeople. Did anybody here see the Emily Mariko social, um, the, the, okay, next slide. There was an influencer. I just have, it's crazy. She, she put together, it was basically leftover salmon plus, um, avocado rice and some seasonings. And, um, this is this screenshot in the middle is from a retailer where they actually set aside shelf space specifically to address the popularity of that one TikTok video because with all the ingredients in the same space. So we decided that it's, we're going to, you know, jump on board and we launched Alaska Seafood Hacks, which was uh, January through March 4th that closed this year, but we're still continuing the momentum from that. It was hugely successful. We worked with a number of influencers um, across the U.S. and we're really pleased to say that in, uh, as of now, we have over 140 million impressions from earned media, social media, and participation in the campaign. It was really one of my favorite parts about it was that we got the industry involved as well. So thank you to OBI Seafoods, Trident Seafoods. Keep going. Um, the tourism industry joined in on the fun. Even Senator Sullivan uh, invited his audience to share their Alaska seafood hacks. And this is from a direct marketer that said, um, table fish, so easy, your kid can make dinner. Um, <laughs> And he did like an in Papio. And it was really great to see everyone's uh, seafood hacks. But the idea being that that Alaska seafood shouldn't be intimidating. Um, and there are great ways that you can make um, easy it easy and fun. Okay, I'm going to wrap up here. But no surprise, consumers want to be more knowledgeable about their seafood in a lot of different ways. Where it comes from, how to cook it, how is it sustainable, who caught it for them. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is where we come in with telling more of a deeper dive on the diff on Alaska seafood stories, um, including this sustainability efforts um, that take place in every different fishery. Next slide. Um, we have a wealth of resources available to our audiences, but also to fishermen and direct marketers. Anyone who is selling Alaska seafood can have access to our massive media library of photos and videos. Here's some some videos that we produced recently. Oh, uh, no, no, that's okay. Um, some beautiful product photography, again, available for anyone selling or marketing Alaska seafood. And then telling the story behind the fish. We think this is our, our most favorite selling point. We've had the honor of coming out to your communities to capture footage over the last three years. Our first, our first trip was actually here in Kodiak in March, 2020, and that was our last one for a while, but it's been great to get back out in the field. This was um, out in Unalaska just last month. Sandpoint last fall, there's our Kodiak shoot, and then up in Naknek last summer. Um, but storytelling is different in every market. Um, we should assume that, that just because it's popular here in the US, it'll work elsewhere. So this is the last video, and then I'm gonna pass it to Bruce. Um, I thought I would share, this is a, a really fun campaign that our um, Japan program executed. We have representation in our international markets because they speak the language and they understand the market better. And they put together this, this great campaign showcasing Alaska seafood sustainability. So if you'll click on that. <laughs> So that was 
that was a, a an intentionally researched campaign that was executed on social media and at, at several retailers in Japan. And um, but you get the gist. Just ask for Alaska to know it's sustainable. Um, so. Just briefly, we have a technical program that's led by John Burroughs on our team. He's a wealth of resources that are available to industry members at any level. Um, if you haven't taken a look at our website, again, I encourage you to do so. There's so much information there that's free and available to any member of the seafood industry. Uh, next slide. Um, it's really easy if you jump to the bottom of our page and click resources, we have a searchable database there. So no matter what you're looking for, whether it's a sell sheet or passive information, um, you can find it there. Uh, ways for you to get involved with ASME, uh, join a committee. We have 10 committees, over 100 industry members that guide our efforts around the globe. Um, attend ASME meetings. They're all open to the public. Uh, if you want to join us in Girdwood in November, we'd love to have you at our annual All Hands on Deck meeting. And then just give us a call. We couldn't do what we do without information from the fleet and from our industry partners to make sure we're maximizing our efforts on your behalf. So that's it. Now I'm going to pass it to Bruce. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, the, the Global Food Aid Program, <clears throat> what is it? You know, it's, uh, uh, a, a, there's a lot of, a lot of different ideas of what it might be. And uh, everything from a, a just a, a philanthropic thing, we're just feeding poor people with old seafood, or it's, uh, it's a subsidy program for the United States government, um, neither of which are, are anywhere near correct. The, the, the Global Food Aid Program started in 2003. Um, I took a, an idea to Governor Murkowski and uh, he said, fine, I like that idea, so you're gonna do it. And he hired me on the spot and I worked out of the governor's office for the next uh, four years. And then uh, I moved over to ASME. And during that time, um, like most new programs, things changed. And the, the, the program uh, sort of started to define itself and, uh, and, 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 and just moved on into quite a few different realms that it, uh, we didn't think about at first. When we first started, there was, no Alaska seafood in any of the uh, US government feeding programs. And to date, I think we have eight different Alaska seafood products being uh, purchased by uh, the United States government. What do they do with this stuff? <clears throat> well, they're, they're feeding Americans is what they're doing. Last year, um, the United States government bought $3 billion worth of food not seafood, but $3 billion worth of food um, for all kinds of different things. Um, one thing people don't really understand is that that, doesn't, that, that, that isn't part of the, 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 the uh, school lunch program. School lunch program is a whole different thing. Um, it's primarily funded, 80% of it's funded with entitlement funds from the Department of Agriculture, but they don't actually buy food for the different uh, school systems. School systems buy their own food. They can buy some through and facilitated by the Department of Agriculture, but for the most part, all the food that they're buying, um, this $3 billion worth of which about $180 million of it, $190 million, something like that uh, was seafood. So we didn't get a very big share. That isn't Alaska seafood, that's all kinds of seafood. Uh, but still, uh, the, most of the food, the, the biggest volume of that food is going into food banks all, the way, all across the country. Uh, everything from pistachios to salmon, sockeye salmon, four ounce individually vacuum packed, boneless skin on portion. Uh, they, they've, they've started to buy more seafood. Uh, just recently here this last year, we got them, the, uh, there was some uh, Pacific Ocean perch, uh, shrimp, uh, even whiting, um, haddock, uh, uh, walleye, 
out of the Great Lakes. So there, there's a lot of different programs. And um, so we try to take advantage of that to expand the market. This is a market expansion program. That's what uh, we designed it for 20 years ago. And uh, um, the Department of Agriculture um, is a customer. It's a great customer. Um, the food they buy is at basically wholesale prices. Uh, it's it's a com all competitive bid. So uh, they put out a, 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 a request to purchase uh, Alaska seafood and they may have three, four, five different people, uh, companies bidding to sell those fish. So the, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of money involved there for the seafood suppliers of Alaska seafood. Um, this last year, as it says there, um, we just, just barely just broke a hundred million dollars in sales. That's cash money to the people that are processing and selling um, our seafood for us. Uh, and, and when you have a big customer like that involved, that leverages demand from all your other customers. They're not gonna, they, they, it, it, it's competition and competition is good as you all know to get the price of our, our seafood up higher. Uh, for, for 2022, we've already exceeded $75 million in uh, sales. Uh, some of that uh, is, uh, the majority of that was a, a very large canned pink salmon purchase. But, uh, and then there was uh, several uh, Alaska Pollock uh, pro uh, products. The Alaska Pollock uh, products include a, uh, an unbreaded uh, filet portion that's cut from block. And then there's nuggets and, and uh, fish sticks. Uh, the salmon products vary. Uh, we have, I, I just mentioned it a few minutes ago, uh, and that, that was for a very specific program, but um, sockeye and coho uh, filet portions, uh, canned uh, pink salmon, canned sockeye salmon, canned chump salmon. Um, and we're working on more all the time. We had uh, uh, POP fillets. Uh, most of those were were uh, supplied off the West Coast. Uh, they're they're able to uh, beat the price point that the Alaska processors can do with the economic challenges we have here. But uh, the point is that it's it is an Alaska product. Um, it, it gives uh, our guys another market for for uh, an American market rather than a, a foreign market. So. Uh, the market's expanding. Um, we, are, we still have commitments over and above the, the $75 million we've sold so far this year. We're already, we, we still have commitments for uh, nearly $40 million worth. And um, I'm expecting to be optimistic. We could get another, we, we could come very close to $200 million worth of Alaska seafood this year. So again, this is market expansion. And in the, in the food aid business, when, when we started this, it was, a, it was mostly uh, on uh, food aid in foreign countries. Those programs kind of changed. They don't do that as much anymore. Uh, actually, I'm working with the, the, uh, the State Department right now as far as uh, Alaska seafood into uh, Ukraine when that gets stable enough to actually get food in there. Um, but not, and everything is pretty much uh, a domestic program now. Uh, we do have a little bit of uh, uh, school feeding in, in Sri Lanka. Um, and there, there's some folks in Africa, but primarily we're, we're doing America. So the, there's an old saying that goes, today's uh, food aid recipient is tomorrow's retail customer. So, you're, you're insecure in your, your food issues. You're, you're, you're getting a lot of your food at the food bank. Things get better. You get a job, whatever happens. And now you're going to the grocery store. You're buying food now that you're used to. 
that you see. And when they're used to eating various products in uh, of Alaska seafood coming out of the food banks, well, we have data that actually shows that it, it has increased that sale of those products. And those products aren't, uh, they're not test tube products. Those are the same ones you'd buy right up here in Safeway or or any other uh, grocery store in uh, in America. So they're they're, vis they're they're visibly available, and uh, like we all do when we go to the grocery store, we buy things that are are familiar. So uh, it's uh, it's kind of like a a, a giant uh, tasting program, sort of like the. You're in Costco and you go to the end of the aisle and here's a lady with a, a toothpick with a little morsel on it. Well, here we've kind of ramped that up. And so now we're doing it with the hundreds of millions of dollars worth of seafood that is purchased from our, our Alaska seafood suppliers and then given away to uh, Americans to eat. So it's, it's been quite an expansion and uh, we're still looking at uh, some other new products uh, right now. We're looking at some surimi products, uh, pink salmon fillets. Um, it, 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 it varies as, it, as, as people ask for it. Uh, so uh, this program does get into a certain amount of product development that uh, working directly with the suppliers our processors as the food aid community, the Department of Agriculture asks for new products and different types of products. So it's, uh, it's growing, it's keeping us busy and uh, it, it is a little bit different than, than the other programs. It's, it's a different kind of marketing. So I'm probably past what I'm supposed to be, so I'm not. Well, why don't we just leave that, leave it there that it, it's very exciting and we're, we're happy to be doing it. And uh, Ashley and I can both take some questions if there are any. There aren't any questions online at the moment, but if anybody here in the audience has some, I'll, I'll direct you right back here so everybody can hear you. No questions, but we must've done a good job, right? Oh. <laughs> um, my question is, I'm thinking of the Buy American Act and the government's preference for purchasing American steel. Um, does the government show any preference for purchasing seafood from American-owned processors? I, should, I probably should have mentioned that. Um, Everything that the Department of Agriculture buys, everything uh, has to be made in America. Uh, Senator Sullivan uh, closed a little loophole a few years ago, I think maybe two years ago, that said the, the school systems have to buy American. Um, and it was, I say it's a loophole because the school systems are using federal dollars to buy the food from Safeway or, you know, uh, Cisco or whomever that it, it may be. So um, that loophole was changed. And so, yes, everything that they buy has to be uh, made in America. There's it, literally, it's not, not even Alaska product that's sent to China and comes back. That's a product of China. So everything has to be, uh, and there's the the food is has got some very 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 specific uh, requirements on how it's made. Uh, for example, canned salmon, for example, um, has to be made fresh. It can't be previously frozen and then canned. So it's um, the 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 specifications get get pretty tight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this could be for both you guys. Great presentation. I was I was curious on um how much of an increased demand you guys have been seeing for um you know like seaweed and or kelp pepper products. I I don't have anything 
I, I don't have anything for that. I, I don't, uh, that, that might, you might have some at, at retail, but uh, um, in the, at the, at the food bank level, they're not buying kelp okay. or kelp products. Ashley may know something about that. That's, that's different. Um, I, I don't know a lot about that. I know there's a lot of work being done by a lot of really smart people to identify that, but uh, um, ASME actually in statute cannot uh, promote um, aquaculture, mariculture product or aquaculture products. So um, we, at this point, kelp and seaweed are not part of our purview. Yeah. Well, that was my question. What would it take to allow ASME to promote mariculture products? Uh, it would take a statute change. So it has to come through legislation. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> Is that a state statute or federal? State, yes. Mm -hmm. It's something we've been working on with a number of partners. It didn't come through this year, but I, you know, it's not to say it, it won't. Um, thanks, Ashley and Bruce. I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about the process for product development, um, for particularly for the global food aid, kind of what goes into that and in the development are um, there kind of some guidelines in terms of, of creating healthy products as well, like um, sodium content and different, um, di different health considerations in, in providing a product that people like too, thanks. Well, that's part of the, the I mentioned it earlier uh, about the, the products need to come like from a, gro they need to be the same ones as you're buying in a grocery store. Um, the department doesn't, they, they're, they're not buying, the, the, this isn't a program for you to go test your, your new products in. And uh, so they, for example, they would like to see that it is sold broadly and it's in the grocery stores. Because if it's not, then it's probably not a very popular product. And maybe as they're feeding, you know, tens of millions of people, they're not sure if it'll be accepted. So if, it, if it's something that you need to show them that, that it's, that there is a broad acceptance for it already. So they'll come, they'll come to us and say, well, what else you got? Well, the primarily the specifications need to be uh, for example, uh, um, the, the size of the portion and how many in a, how many in the serving bag, for example, our, our, uh, our, our, our salmon filet portions, they come in a, in a two pound bag, a resealable bag. All right. So that's, I, I know that that's, that's a little above the product, but it is, there's packaging requirements there's for they it's uh whether the skin's on whether the skin's off for example the uh one of the first pollock uh products that uh, they came and asked us about that and um using pollock block which is primarily you know, that's probably 90 percent of the pollock industry um we added a little we there's a serpentine cut on one edge of the, of the filet portion that makes it look a little bit more like a fish. Um, uh, Health-wise, uh, I remember it was, a, it was quite some time ago. Um, there was a, a, a rest, we, we put some, had some recipes put together and we didn't look at them close enough. It was beautiful, there was lots of them, uh, but the sodium content was too high and they they didn't want to have anything to do with that that nice little uh booklet that we had made for uh the recipients and where all that's that that the sodium we finally figured out where it came from it came from the mayonnaise like in uh for making a a salmon salad sandwich or something so they, they there's there there is a certain amount of uh of health involved with that, uh, I mentioned they, they don't want uh, the canned salmon, for example, being being previously frozen. It doesn't make as good a product as it does uh, if it's if it's canned from fresh. So they, they look at different uh, sizes and shapes and colors um, for the for the raw products. And 
And that's they, they buy pretty much, it's all uh, basic products, whether it's pistachios, like I mentioned earlier, or frozen vegetables, uh, frozen fruit, fresh fruit. It's all, it, it, there, there, there aren't a lot of um, things that, that have a whole bunch of ingredients in them. So the, and when they come and ask for ideas for different things, um, then you have to go to the processors. And so I interact with all them uh, nearly every day on something or another. Uh, they they, they want to know, I mean, can you produce this? No. <laughs> you know, uh, I had a, there's a, a group on the West Coast, for example, that, want, that, that wants them to start buying Dover Soul. And so I, I contacted uh, some of the, the, uh, the buyers around here and, well, how much Dover sold you by last year? None. Okay, well, we're not going to be able to play in that particular category. Uh, but if they want it, that's fine. We try to get it for them. We work with the processors of what they can do, you know, what size are the fish? Uh, is it going to work out price point? Can you afford to, can you even afford to do that here? And if it isn't, we, we move on to another and try a different, a different product. So we're always doing that. We, we worked on uh, canned herring for a while. We worked on herring fillets for a while. Um, we worked on, well, we're still trying, we're still working on uh, surimi products right now for uh, school lunch snacks, things like that. And uh, so it's, it's, it's really a collaborative effort between us uh, the, the industry and uh, the department. Okay, well, good. Thank you. Oh, 